All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be kicking us off today. My name is Shailen Jotishi. I'm the CEO of the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance and the Senior Analyst at the Think Tank New America in Washington, D.C. For those of you who are new to our organization, for 10 years, JSPG has been the international open access platform for students, postdocs, policy fellows, and early career researchers of all academic backgrounds to contribute substantive policy solutions addressing every imaginable dimension of science, technology, and innovation policy and management debate, ranging from how to address space debris to new models for climate action, which is salient today. Through strategic partnerships, like with our friends at AAAS and the United Nations, the UK Science and Innovation Network, NSPN, and many others, our mission is to publish, nurture, and help elevate next generation voices in science and technology policy. This event marks the fourth of a six part expert dialogue series uh, co-hosted by JSPG and AAAS. This series coincides with the latest call for papers, which is supported generously by the Kavli Foundation. JSPG and AAAS invite early career scientists, engineers, and policy professionals to submit policy position papers covering a myriad of topics that will help a build, a build a better future of American science and science policy. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, all recordings will be posted on our YouTube channel, which I hope you'll follow. We'll include the links in the chat. This call for papers celebrates the 75 year anniversary of Vannevar Bush's seminal text, Science the Endless Frontier, which set the stage of much of US science policy to date. Each of our expert di dialogues will help authors get a better sense of where they might focus their writing with an eye towards key focal areas relating to Endless Frontier. We invite ambitious, bold, and entrepreneurial ideas tackling the nation's most urgent and important science policy problems. The deadline to submit is April 4th, and you can learn more at sciencepolicyjournal.org. Don't miss out on any opportunities. Follow JSPG on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We also have a monthly newsletter for special opportunities and ways to engage. All links will be dropped in the chat for you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact myself or members of our team, Joanne Lee, Adriana Bankston, and Sahil Mehta. Without Joanne, Adriana, and Sahil, we would not be gathered here today. So much gratitude to all of you. Today, we have an amazing panel to shed some light on how US science policy can help us address environmental and climate change challenges. And I'm going to share my screen so you can see an image card to get a better sense of, of our great lineup today. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce these speakers, but their CVs are so long that their CVs alone could fill a volume of JSPG. So these will be brief introductions. Please read their bios online. While I do that, please follow them on and their organizations on, on Twitter, tweet us, share your thoughts, we'll be amplifying you throughout the session, and the person who tweets the most will be invited to contribute to a special JSPG blog feature at the conclusion of our webinar series. First up is our moderator, David Goldston. David is the director of the MIT Washington office where he shapes MIT's policy and positions regarding federal matters. David was previously Director of Government Affairs at the Natural Resource Defense Council and spent more than 20 years on Capitol Hill working on science and environmental policy issues, including serving as Chief of Staff to the House Committee on Science for six years. He's taught at Princeton, Harvard, and Georgetown and was a columnist at Nature. He served on many advisory committees and boards with the National Academies and other prominent science policy organizations. Gabrielle Dreyfus is a senior scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. She was previously deputy director for the Department of Energy's Office of International Climate and Clean Energy and a AAAS fellow at NOAA, where she helped develop NOAA's platinum standard and contributed to scientific response to Deepwater Horizon and other projects. She also worked in the US Senate on energy and climate issues. Tim Profeta is director of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy at Duke University, a nonpartisan player in national environmental debate. 
Prior to Duke, Tim was counsel to the, for the environment to Joe Lieberman, where he was the principal architect of the Lieberman-McCain Climate Stewardship Act. He's had many advisory positions, including leadership roles with AAAS COSEP. David Hart is a professor at George Mason University and the senior fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, the top ranked science and technology policy think tank. David is also a member of the JSBG board, so much gratitude to you, David, for your work with us. David has worked in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. He co-chairs the Innovation Policy Forum at the National Academies and has many other distinguished positions in our space. Lastly, we have Amanda Stout, who's director on the Board of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate, as well as the Polar Research Board at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. She was a senior climate scientist at the Natural National Wildlife Federation focused on climate science communication, among many other topics. She spearheaded the Academy's first booklet on climate change for public audiences. Panel, thank you so much for joining us. It's, we're honored and excited to learn along with you. We'll turn things over to David Goldston to take it from here. As always, we'll have a discussion with the panel for about 30 minutes or so, followed by an audience Q&A for 20 minutes or so. Please share your questions in the chat. The JSPG team will be monitoring. Live tweet, the graphic you see on screen is also available online at sciencepolicyjournal.org. The person who tweets the most will be invited to contribute to a JSPG Perspectives blog over the coming months. And that goes for all of our series. I did want to make one special announcement before turning things over to David. This is the week of the AAAS annual meeting. So, um, what we also have on our call for submissions page is a special video feature, including the president of the National Academies, Marcia McNutt, Suda Parikh, the CEO of AAAS, and the former NSF and OSTP director under President Clinton, Neil Lane, uh, sharing some thoughts about where early career researchers might focus their writing. You also hear from past speakers in this series, as well as early career voices on their hopes and dreams for the future of American science. David, thanks so much for moderating. Please take it away. Great. Um, thanks, Shailen. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I have to say, I'm wondering if it'd be more beneficial to have a, an award for the fewest number of tweets, but that may be just me showing my age. Um, the uh, So we, have, we do have a great panel, as you said, and it, it's varied in many ways, scientists and non-scientists, people have been in government and haven't, people have been in a wide variety of advisory roles on science, technology, and policy. So. Um, we will hear from them in the order in which uh, Shailen introduced them. Everyone, including me, will uh, try to make relatively brief remarks, and then we'll have a conversation among ourselves and uh, also if it's questions. Um, and uh, I think you put the questions in the chat is the way that we're doing it. So um, let me start by making a few opening remarks. So. Um, <clears throat> this, as Shailen said, is part of a series uh, on the, based on, as a takeoff point, on the Endless Frontier Report from 1945. I think this is unique among the panels in that um, we're dealing with a topic that uh, Vannevar Bush did not mention in that report. Climate policy appears nowhere in the 1945 report. And in fact, there wasn't in a federal report, the issue didn't come up in a federal report for another 20 years after that. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. The main one obviously being that people hadn't been thinking about climate change, although the theories behind it already existed. But I think there's even a, a deeper reason which is relevant to this, which is that um, the Endless Frontier Report really didn't think about science as an input to policy. Um, and uh, so what we now call science for policy just wasn't on Bush's mind in the report. And that's important because the science for policy brings up different issues than other kinds of government science because it is um, inherently uh, political. Now, these days we often sometimes think of political as simply a pejorative, but um, in this case, I mean it much more neutrally. I like to say all you need for politics are two people and a choice. Um, it's how you make public decisions. And, um, Climate in particular is uh, a political issue in that sense, in that it involves 
economics, risk tolerance, there are winners and losers, geographic issues, time horizons, all of those are inherently political issues. There's no way for them not to be political. Therefore, my antenna always come up when people go up when people say climate has been politicized because there is no way for climate to be apolitical. Obviously, there are aspects of the science that can be apolitical, but the issue, the where the science and the policy intersect, those are political in a way that there's just um, no way around. Um, I think that the political nature of the climate policy question is actually going to become even more apparent now that we have a, an administration really for the first time that has fully embraced climate as a priority issue. Um, and that's going to bring to the fore many kinds of questions and many kinds of choices um, and many questions about the science and uses of science that maybe were kind of hidden or eclipsed when the only issue was an endless stalemate on um, and people arguing about whether anthropogenic climate change exists or not. Um, so I think uh, this, this sense of the way climate and the climate science and climate policy intersect is going to be um, put in ever bolder relief, which I think is going to be um, a challenge in good ways as well as uh, more difficult ones for scientists and policymakers, for that matter. Um, another way in which the climate issue is inherently political is it is fundamentally at its base a values issue. I mean, fossil fuels work just fine from many viewpoints if you're not worried about the future of the planet or don't think that they um, threaten the future of the planet. Um, I sometimes say that really the climate issue is the first significant discussion of changing the motive force of the entire economy for moral reasons since the fight over ending slavery. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind um, the extent to which um, it's sort of epical in that sense. Um, there are lots of reasons for keeping that in mind, but one is I know that scientists sometimes feel like, oh, nothing has moved forward because of the science. I think that's not true. And including the fact that just, including just the fact that um, the climate issue has sort of moved from the pages of, of scientific journals, arcane scientific journals, maybe that's redundant, um, to you know the front, lines of political debate where it's been for a, for some time. And I think that's actually not something that gets ta to take for granted. Uh, issues moving from scientific circles into political circles is not something that happens with every issue. And the fact that it's front and center now, even though we're way behind where most of us would like to be, um, is actually an achievement, especially given, again, the scale of the issue we're talking about. So, um, and despite that scale, and I think it's important to recognize that there is overwhelming, well, there is strong public support for climate action. That's, it's obviously divided uh, in partisan terms, but if you look at overall support and recognize that um, one side of the partisans is actually a declining point portion of the population, um, there is broad support. I think also what we'll see and what we've seen before is what presidents say has a big impact on where the um, public opinion numbers go. And I, so I think um, it's, not a, it's been moving in the right direction over time in general. And I think that is likely in many ways um, to accelerate uh, at, at least uh, in the initial period of President Biden and his um, cabinet and other government officials talking more about why climate is important and the opportunities it presents for positive change, not just what the problems are. Um, in fact, um, I started my day to day talking to some folks who are actually working on uh, moving conservative Republicans toward uh, real climate action. And while they have a hard road to hoe, the, um, the, 
the fact that there actually are conservative Republican groups that now feel they have to have some kind of positive stance toward climate, whatever actual policies they endorse, is a change and something that's a signal of where things are going in the US. So I'll finish by saying, I mean, I'm not Pollyannish about this. We're much further behind than I would have predicted when I first started working on this issue decades ago. Um, the predictions about climate impacts have only gotten more dire and American politics is in uh, a certainly a polarized and difficult place. But all that said, I think there's in even in more quarters than would have been expected, um, a growing appetite for ideas and proposals and the science to inform them. And so I think it's very timely that we have this discussion and that um, the call for papers is uh, out there. So I do encourage everybody to really get involved and uh, recognize this in the larger, the importance of this and the openness in the larger context. So with that, um, we'll start with Gabrielle and um, we'll go down the line. And then I said, as I said, we'll have a conversation. So again, welcome to everybody. Thank you, David, very much for that introduction. There's something that I've learned from David and we've had a chance to teach together. And in fact, I got into science policy thanks to a course that David was teaching when I was a graduate student at Princeton. Uh, David tends, has the saying, if you, there's a tendency of scientists to believe that if you knew what I know, you would think like I think. And that's wrong in multiple ways. And it gets to this values idea um, in terms of climate and the economic impacts that's going to have, if you are an industry that sees an existential threat to putting a price on carbon, we can have the same information, but I do not think we will think the same way. Similarly, David introduced the concept of science for policy, and that's where I spend my day. But he also, um, I, I wanted to, for those who will be writing papers, provide a framework that also includes the concept of policy for science. And I bring that up in this context when you're thinking about budgets, prioritization, and who does the science. One of the things that's really important, I think, for this generation is that if you know what I know, you think like I think, also changes when you have different people doing the science with different experiences. And so I would really encourage folks as you put your paper, your pens to paper on position policies, uh, policy positions, that you think about that as well. So a little bit more about where I'm coming from. So I'm uh, with a, a nonprofit organization, a non-governmental organization, the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. In my day-to-day, -day, like today, I am talking with scientists, with industry, with advocates, with both uh, environmental advocates, but also lobbyists from industry. I'm talking with lawyers. And I'm talking with technical experts. And I think, uh, ah, funders. I'm also talking with funders, both public funders and private funders uh, from governments and from, from philanthropy. And so there is a really rich space for people who are scientists to live and operate at the science advocacy line, which is where I spend my days. And that's a really important place to do science for policy. Um, there is a concept of use-inspired science that fits in this place. This is uh, Pester's quadrant for those who are aware of that terminology. And I'm also borrowing from uh, Jane Lubchenco who uh, wrote a piece in 1998 in Science about a social contract for science and talking about use-inspired science. Now, an example, a really great example of use-inspired science today is the vaccines that have been created in a remarkably short period of time. In the climate context, one of the examples that I'm using this week is the natural experiment of COVID and how that affected our use of energy and the implications of both a reduction in CO2 emissions, but we also saw a reduction in the co-emitted species including cooling aerosol sulfates that reduced um, when we turned the knob as people stopped driving, there was a lower energy emissions for industry. So we're actually seeing a real time experiment that shows us that unlike in the models, you cannot independently turn the CO2 knob. It has other implications. And a recent paper that just came out that I'm using for my work 
shows how there's actually, even though there's been a seven to 8% reduction in 2020 in CO2 emissions, there was actually a slight regional warming due to that reduction in cooling aerosols at the same time. And so being able to translate this science that's happening now, this use inspired science that's telling us about how the planet works to inform policymakers about why it's so important that we think not just about CO2, when we think about slowing warming in the near term, we need to think about all the other implications and the fact that there are other climate pollutants that we can control such as methane from agriculture and black carbon from other kinds of burning and a, a personally priority topic, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, which are controlled now under the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances. So um, just wanted to provide a little bit of uh, nuance there on some of the things that are really timely today that there is space for and just to get you some thinking in some terms and if there's some questions, um, I think the Montreal Protocol is a great example of a very strong institution that uses science added in its DNA to inform policy decisions and has been tremendously successful at saving the planet in two ways, putting the ozone layer on track to healing and actually having the biggest impact on slowing global warming of any treaty yet out there. So with that, David, I'll wrap up and pass back to the next person. Great, thanks, Gabrielle. Tim, you're up next. Thanks, David, and, and thanks, Gabrielle. Can I actually, before I just start talking, I was having a little internet issue. I think I've got resolved, but can you hear me okay? Great. Um, always always a pleasure to, to be on the panel with, with my colleagues here and particularly to hear David's insights. And I have not heard his metaphor to slavery in terms of the scope of the economic transition that climate asked of us, but I find that, uh, I think, you know, uh, levels the expectation here of how big this challenge is, but how important it is in terms of the future of the country. Um, I, I come to you a little bit, even more than Gabrielle from the science for policy perspective here. I've spent my last two decades in my career uh, focus in various policy positions on the climate challenge and on utilizing uh, science and science uh, to, to help try and move the needle towards solutions to the climate issue. Um, I, as, as was noted in my instruction, I run something called the Nicholas Institute at Duke, which is a, a really a bridge institution. Its job is to make, to, to acquire knowledge out of the great University of Duke University and the knowledge that that university can gather from all of its other peers and make it actionable for people who are in policy positions. So often we're, we're, we're asked, you know, how do we put that scientific knowledge at the, at the, uh, at the service of society? Um, most recently, and, you know, I, I, I've co-chaired a project we called the Climate 21 Project, which was a uh, whole of government approach to how one would tackle climate change should the administration entering uh, power in 2021 desire to do it. And uh, we surveyed about 150 colleagues who had served in government and really tried to at least kind of create the user guide for the government so that uh, climate policy could be accurate as quickly as possible. And I'm gonna try and bring a little of that perspective to the conversation here today to try and give a sense of, you know, what are the issues that are really uh, it, particularly at this very, as David noted, this moment in time when we have an administration entering in with an aggressive, comprehensive approach to the climate issue, what are, what are the sort of core issues that we see that are going to um, emerge at the front? So just, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, thinking about the whole of government approach, I think one of the really interesting things here is that there is going to be, it's clear there's going to be a surfeit of opportunities to have, to, to have knowledge uh, made actionable across government. And by that, I mean, uh, one of the things I think you're going to see with this administration is that um, they're, they're using levers of government that weren't deployed on the climate challenge. And I think in full appreciation of the comprehensive impacts and stakes of the climate challenge across the whole economy, they are going to try and address the climate challenge and the transition challenge across the whole government and all the authorities. By this, I mean, you're not just going to be looking at EPA and the emissions regulations there or DOE and the innovation budgets there. 
but you're also going to be looking at things like the agriculture department and the idea of building a carbon bank that can pay uh, landowners, uh, you know, land managers for, for storing carbon in the soil. You're going to be looking at the defense department and all the engines of innovation that lie in the defense department. You're going to be looking at the financial regulators and making sure that the way capital flows through our economy appreciates the risk of climate change. You're going to be looking at the, 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 the regulators of infrastructure, like the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and making sure we run the wires from where you can get zero carbon energy to where people use electrons. Uh, so it, it, there is going to be a tremendous scope of, uh, of inquiry and, and opportunity to engage in this, in this the policy moment um, we are in. And in saying that, I also want to note very explicitly that this is, uh, there, there, there are traditional science, natural sciences, material sciences, engineering is going to be a key question, but this is at its heart an ethical and equitable issue for society. And all of the sort of social sciences and the like are going to be brought to the bear on these questions as well. We're going to solve the questions that, that David was uh, talking about in his in his uh, begin, uh, introduction. Um, I just want to flag a couple of things that I, you know, I see, uh, you know, rising to the fore with the Biden administration in, in, in the beginning of this, uh, this year. Um, one is the policy of innovation. Um, there was, a, there is, there is now a whole of government task force, all the cabinet officials coming together around a table, trying to design the first hundred days of this administration, a comprehensive strategy. This is, a very powerful move by the administration. You can see that this has been done in other administrations at the very front of the administration, even in the Bush Chain Energy Task Force in 2001. The, the group that wrote the Clean Air Act in 1989 in the first Bush administration, if you can get the government organized around a prior topic at the very outset of the administration, it's a very powerful thing to design a strategy. That is happening right now. The first meeting happened, and the, that meeting focused on innovation policy about the creation of possibly an ARPA-C, an advanced research project uh, agency for climate expressly, but also about you know, announcing things like there's going to be $100 million out of ARPA-E, the ARPA for Energy, focused entirely on low, low carbon uh, technologies. Um, that is, there's an innovation task force being um, formed. There's a woman named Sonia Agarwal, who's fabulous, who's been brought into the White House to lead innovation. Um, and uh, I think uh, I think that's going to be a priority topic, particularly at the very outset of this administration, because the very outset, I think the agenda of our policy is going to be how do we reinvest in our country to recently our economy coming out of COVID, and so how to basically supercharge innovation as much as they can is going to be an idea. Second issue I'd flag is the uh, is the equity issue, the the political economy, the the you know the comparative economics of where the both the, uh, the impacts of climate lie and also the impacts of the transition lie. These are going to be, you know, really vexing issues. The, uh, the Biden administration has made strong pledges that this will be an equitable transition. 40% of the money is supposed to go to low-income and minority communities. The metrics of what that means and what it means to, for that money to contribute to the benefit of those communities, I think is undefined. I think that is in the, in the realm of a campaign promise that's looking for a definition, there's going to be a lot of tremendous work that needs to be done to help guide that. Um, also, there, there's going to be a lot of focus on the just transition in an industrial policy and the innovation policy necessary to make sure that the people who are going to be impacted the most by the transition itself, the people who are in the fossil fuel uh, dependent communities, et cetera, have a, have a path forward, both because it's moral to make sure that the that the, the Americans have a, a way for a good livelihood and political, because those are the communities that are going to have the most concern. Uh, issues of resilience, I think we're kind of behind uh, the the, uh, the curve, unfortunately, in terms of where the, but they're going to be essential too. Um, and looking at the engineering challenge of a lifetime to think about how we make our natural systems more resilient uh, to the impact of climate change. Finally, I, I think I think, uh, and I think if you look at the most recent NAS report, which I'm sure one of my my panelists talk about, there are some very fundamental steps that need to happen to to uh, to, to really meet the mid-century challenge uh, in terms of uh, the, just the pathway that we have to take in our energy usage and the transition we have to to, to make in our energy usage. One is we need to decarbonize electricity. The Biden administration has promised to 
fully decarbonize the utility sector by 2035. And that, that is a, 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 quite a challenge because it may not be able to happen because of politics legislatively. So the EPA may be writing rules to make, make uh, emissions requirements get us there. Those will be likely very based in feasibility of technology, given the way the law is written, and looking at the technologies for CCS, carbon capsule storage, are going to be, I think, a very essential engineering inquiry, science inquiry question for setting those standards. Second, we need to electrify transportation and other major sectors, and the, the needs for battery technology and infrastructure and like to support that. And third, we really need to look at ways that we can uh, provide economic services from sectors that are hard to, hard, can't be electrified, hard to decarbonize, and looking for things like the hydrogen uh, economy to merge to be able to provide the 20, uh, a path for that 2050 decarbonization path. Um, Target. I'm going to stop here and, and, and look forward to hearing from Amanda and David, but I really appreciate the time and, and, and being able to share this, uh, this session with you. David Hart, you're next. Sorry, I was on. Thanks, David. I figured that's what you were saying. Yeah. Um, so thanks for inviting me. I just want to salute the journal and the amazing work and the fact that so many of you are wanting to spend part of your Friday afternoon with us, uh, I think is testimony to their work. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to have three careers without changing my profession. Um, I began, and it's a traditional academic, first publishing for disciplinary audiences. My background is in political science and then for multidisciplinary audiences in science and technology policy. Um, then as uh, David mentioned, I was fortunate to spend a year at the OSTP and got to become a member of the policy community in, in the standard sense. I had a short foray into academic administration, but uh, for the last several years, really been um, publishing mostly for policy and general audiences. I run a group at a think tank on clean energy innovation policy. Now, in doing this, I draw on my academic background all the time. Uh, I do want to note an irony. We're speaking about the 75th anniversary of the Bush report, and I will say that my dissertation was intended to knock the Bush report off its pedestal, which I clearly uh, failed to do. Um, but, but anyway, um, I draw on my academic work all the time, but um, the theory has to be submerged. Um, the theory lies in the background and the goal of the writing is to be accessible. And another thing I think that is different between uh, writing for these audiences and academic audiences is making um, the main points uh, immediately apparent to every reader. So you have to think about readers who only have 15 seconds and then other readers who have hours and be able to speak to readers who have all those different scopes of time and levels of detail. Um, so I really like the criteria that uh, the journal has laid out for this contest that some of you might enter looking for uh, the best policy papers, uh, salience, pragmatism, and inventiveness. So if somebody has to care about it, that's salience. They have to be able to do something about it, that's pragmatism. And ideally it's something that nobody else has thought of. Now, Again, you don't save that to the very end of the paper and surprise someone like you might in an academic piece, but you put it in the headline, put it in the first sentence. Um, so those are great criteria and I hope you'll keep those in mind for those of you who are gonna enter the contest. Uh, I work on the policy for science side of things. That is the innovation agenda that Tim talked about that was the subject of the meeting at the White House yesterday, which I dearly would have loved to be a member of. Um, and really love looking at, some of you may have seen the Zoom image of everybody involved in that meeting, which was very exciting. Uh, so I thought I would talk about that. I wanna frame it in terms of four tensions that have to be managed and that you might keep in mind again as you're, if you are taking up the innovation agenda part of the, of the climate challenge. Uh, so one challenge is balancing domestic and international objectives. We need options, technological options that can scale globally um, particularly for the sectors that Tim mentioned, the hard to decarbonize sectors like industry and agriculture. Uh, but as my um, boss at uh, ITIF often says, it's not American warming, it's global warming. So the, the technologies have to be used uh, everywhere, but in order to warrant a, a federal investment, they have to have an American political constituency. Um, we know that altruism is not a winning strategy in American politics. You need to have policies that are gonna help regions or help industries or help some constituencies. So you have to balance that international objective with the domestic constituency. 
Uh, a second balance is supply push and demand pull policies. Uh, by supply push, I mean R&D spending. I spent a lot of time on this. We did a little book on this, and one of my colleagues on that book is now uh, working for, for Secretary Kerry or Envoy Kerry to distinguish him from the actual Secretary of State. A little confusing there. Um, so we need that supply push, but we also need policies on the demand side. Um, so that ideas turn into products, whether it's demonstration, whether it's financial support for early adopters, whether it's smart regulation. So that's another tension, supply push and demand pull. Third has to do with incumbents and uh, new entrants. Um, incumbents like to say the customer is always right. They really know how to meet their customer's needs. Um, and that means they're gonna resist challenges to their core competencies. But they really know how to scale. They've got giant balance sheets. They can spend billions and billions of dollars on a good idea, which is great if you wanna take something globally. On the other hand, entrepreneurs like to quote Steve Jobs who said the customer is always wrong because they don't actually know what they need or what's out there. Um, and we know that radical innovations often come from outside uh, uh, industries. So we need policies that balance those two things. Hopefully startups have the ideas and then incumbents can come in and, and scale them and, and both uh, benefit. And then the last one, and that's closely related to these others, is the balance between competition and cooperation, whether we're talking about countries, whether we're talking about company, companies, whether we're talking about researchers, both of them are valuable, right? It's great to have competition, but also uh, cooperation. So I spent a lot of time thinking about demonstration projects. These are meant to prove the technical and economic viability of, of new um, technologies, especially large scale technologies like you know, power plants. Um, and on the one hand, you wanna have that data, that performance data made public, right? There's cooperation there, prove to the customer that this is gonna be a worthwhile thing for them to spend their money on, prove to the industry that it can be done. But on the other hand, the developers of these new technologies, you know, they need to get something out of it as well. Um, otherwise they're just giving something away to their competitors. So, um, so you know, again, there's a balance just in that one policy between competition and cooperation, but I think it's a broader tension. So, you know, those are four themes that you might think about. Um, you know, how do you balance those? Maybe it doesn't come up in every particular area, but I think in any particular area, you'll see one or more of them. And uh, with that, I will yield back to David. Thank you. Thanks, David. That's a great overview. I, you know, it occurs to me that actually, Another tension is one in the assignment between pragmatism and novelty, um, which can also be um, sometimes figuring out how, what the through line is there. In fact, uh, it brought to mind uh, a line from a classic history book about the Declaration of Independence where Karl Becker said that um, there was nothing new in, de in the Declaration of Independence because nothing would have been more foolish than to try to galvanize world opinion with ideas no one had ever heard of before. Um, and so uh, that's, it's a very interesting kind of interplay there too. Last, but definitely not least uh, from National Academies, Amanda, please. Well, thank you so much, David. And it's really a privilege to be on this panel. Um, I've already learned so much. Um, in our prep session, I offered to go last thinking that the Academy has such a broad purview and I'll, uh, I'll see what everyone else talks about and kind of fill in the gaps. And if anything, I, it backfired because now I have a lot more things that I would love to kind of dig into because everybody had such great ideas. So hopefully we'll have time in the Q&A to kind of explore some of these things. Um, so I am, uh, uh, am trained as an atmospheric chemist, but I've spent my entire postgraduate career working at the science policy interface and most of it at the National Academies. Um, in my current role, I um, provide oversight to the Academy's work related to climate, um, as well as weather and air pollution and polar issues. And so I um, have a pretty broad uh, view into the um, Academy's work. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the National Academies, we were founded in 1863 by a congressional mandate. Um, and we are an independent nonprofit that provides advice to the government and also serves as the uh, preeminent honorary body for the scientists um, in, in the United States. And we are composed of three academies, the National Academy of Science, the Academy of Engineering, and the Academy of Medicine. So sometimes that can be confusing as we have many different names we go by. Um, and so in my role, I have a, a, a really have the privilege of 
being at this juncture um, where I get to work with the nation's leading scientists and with the leaders in, in the sort of federal science space and thinking about um, how the nation invests in research um, related to climate mostly, um, as well as helping think about and interpret the findings for research um, to inform policy and programs. Um, and um, so I, I feel like I have a nice vantage point into some of the issues that are coming up. And um, you know, and one of the things that I thought I would highlight in my remarks is um, some of the challenges that um, I see us facing um, in a number of the projects across the academies. And then I'll, I'll provide some examples of some of the specific topics that we're thinking about right now and working on. Um, and when David Goldstein opened it up and said, there's a huge, appetite now for innovation. I, I completely agree. And it's very exciting. But at the same time, I'm a little bit daunted by all the details and the practicalities of taking all that appetite and bringing it into practice. Um, and in the climate research space, um, as we think about how to make decisions and advice about what climate research should get public support and how we organize that research, I think there are some, some pressures on that that are creating some interesting questions, things that might be interesting to dig into in a policy position paper. I see that the discussions we're having about the future of climate research is that it's driving it to be even more convergent, more truly interdisciplinary, more societally driven, more justice or equity oriented, and more urgent. And um, you know, as I think about climate science, I think there's always been this assumption that a lot of the work that we do is societally driven or convergent. Um, however, what we're hearing now more and more and what our committees are saying is that we need to do much better. Um, and this, I think, begs questions of how we need to revisit our existing mechanisms for determining research priorities. What does that mean in practice? And with the inertia of the system, how do we make adjustments that meet the urgency of the climate problem? And I think these are all pretty non-trivial problems that we've confronted for a while. So a couple examples. Um, one area that we work on a lot are the research priorities for the Global Change Research Program or the USGCRP. Um, the Global Change Research Program was founded in 1990 in the Global Change Research Act of 1990. And it is the coordinating mechanism within the federal government to um, look at research across 13 federal agencies. Um, the National Academies are called out in that act to advise the program on their research priorities. So we have reviewed their strategic plans and we have an ongoing advisory committee that interacts with them on a regular basis. Um, and um, when the program was originally started in the 1990s, the primary driving questions for global change research were more along the lines of, is climate change happening? Can we detect the change? Can we attribute it to humans? Um, and can we model and project future change with some reliability? So the initial formation of that program was really driven by those kinds of investments in observing and climate modeling and understanding things like how clouds and aerosols work, for example. Um, as we get to today, when the questions are much more about who is it impacting and how and when and what can we do about it, those initial investments are really perhaps not the right ones to meet the research questions of the future. Yet there's a lot of inertia built into the system. And, the, um, and, and so that's one area. Well, how do we take the, the, the Global Change Research Program under the Global Change Research Act and think about how we pivot it in this way? And it's not that they don't recognize in it. And it's not that the National Academies hasn't told them a lot of times that they need to do this. Um, but they will kind of say, well, our hands are tied because we have to be, uh, we're constrained by our agency mandates in terms of what kind of research we can do. So I think that's an interesting thing to, to dig into. And there's more and more discussions about, do we need to revisit the Global Change Research Act um, and, and you know, re, um, reopen that uh, or update it in some fashion? Um, Another um, issue that I see happening more, and I, some of the previous um, panelists talked about equity and um, sort of meeting different users' needs and defining research priorities. And I would say in the National Academy space and other environments I've been in, there's been a lot of focus on getting diverse 
panels of experts together to answer questions that have been posed by our government sponsors. And um, there has been less effort in terms of bringing together diverse points of view to ask the questions and determine what are the questions that we need to go after. Um, and we're seeing this kind of tension play out in particularly topics like solar geoengineering or climate intervention, where um, this is a very publicly controversial topic. Um, and um, to, the, to a large extent, it has been driven out of the scientific community. Um, and yet it impacts, you know, if we were to proceed with deployment of these kinds of tech, and maybe I should step back for those who don't know what those kind of technologies are. Those are deliberate interventions in the Earth's atmosphere to reflect sunlight back to space. Um, and the most promising approaches that are being, and I'm promising is probably too strong of a word, but the approaches that have been proposed involve ejecting aerosols into the stratosphere um, or brightening clouds in the marine boundary, la boundary layer. Um, so there's a big um, part of the community that thinks that there should be active public participation and engagement in defining the research priorities in this space. That comes from a, a place, I think a good intention, but in practice, there are questions about, well, when and where and who and how should we be engaging in making those decisions? Because in theory, if you were to try to change the climate of the entire planet, it would affect everybody and everybody's a stakeholder. So I think there's a there's that kind of tension could be another kind of thing that would be really interesting to dig into. I'm going to pause now because I probably could keep going for a long time and we can <laughs> move on to questions, but thank you again for having me. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so we do have some questions. So um, I'm going to not um, ask any of my own. These are all really good questions that cover a range of issues. So the first one is um, a question asking about uh, the relationship between Vannevar Bush's basic and applied science, how does that show up today in fields like environmental science and ecology? Um, does it look different from other um, areas? So let me just say a word and then maybe we'll go to, I think almost everybody have, probably has it, but maybe we'll start with Gabrielle and Amanda. The um, Although I, I suspect, I don't know, I, if I remember David's uh, dissertation probably takes aim at the basic versus applied as one of its uh, efforts to knock uh, Bush off his pedestal. But um, it's interesting. I think it gets to one thing that Gabrielle talked about in her introduction, something called Pastor's Quadrant after a book by Donald Stokes, which created the category use inspired basic research. So in other words, basic long-term research is not applied research, but it's got a particular goal in mind. And I think a lot of the research um, related to environmental problems is like that, right? It's open long term research, but with a goal of solving particular problems that have um, uh, real, real life implications. Um, and the only thing I, I'd add before turning it over is um, the flip side of that, which I, I don't think Stokes worried about, I haven't read the book in a while, but the um, sometimes that very use inspiredness, which on the one hand drives it, makes it what people want, also lead people who want to attack the science to say, oh, you had your end goal in mind, right? That it wasn't just the use of it, but the specific finding that people went out looking for. And so um, on the one hand, people want climate science that actually can answer climate questions. On the other hand, there's no climate or maybe even ecological more broadly finding that's not immediately, um, doesn't immediately imply certain political things and then is attacked sometimes on that basis. So it's, it's a little, the double-edged sword is maybe, um, there's maybe more of a double-edged sword than, than Stokes or for that matter, Pasteur um, had in mind. But um, Gabrielle, why don't we see if you have something to add and we can, can go to see if anyone else does. Yeah, David, I think that's a really good summary. And actually, one of the things that the Montreal Protocol as an institution does really well to defend against that edged sword 
is it actually has two different kinds of expert panels built into its institutional structure for informing the decision makers, those who negotiate the treaty. There's something called the scientific assessment panel, which every four years puts out an assessment of the ozone and it is based on peer reviewed literature and it says what we know. It doesn't say what to do with that information, it says what we know. There is a separate set of panels. I am informed on participate in one of them called the Technology and Economic Assessment Panel. And this job is in this pan, these panels are intended to make the science actionable. And in this particular case, when the Montreal Protocol says you need to phase out, or the science says the ozone layer is at risk from these particular chemicals and it will be harmed in these ways unless they are reduced to these amounts. The TEEP panel then is able to work with experts sector by sector to identify what are the technologies that are available today, how much do they cost, and provide this information in an actionable way so that negotiators are able then to put together the decisions to say, okay, this is the timeline that we're going to phase out or phase down these substances in these sectors. And so there's a really useful um, differentiation that I think has made the Montreal Protocol particularly effective. Great, thanks. Amanda, I mean, what you were saying about USGCRP about the Global Science Research Program was partly that um, maybe it gotten too much sort of just science for science sake and not use inspired enough, or at least the uses hadn't caught up with the current po politics. Do you want to say more on that? Yeah, I mean, I sometimes feel like um, climate scientists feel like, well, I'm working on the climate, therefore I must be doing something that's societally beneficial. And it kind of feel like they feel like they have a pass. <laughs> and I think increasingly that is not going to fly, that there needs to be real engagement with um, communities and users. And, and let me give an example from my polar side. So um, the National Science Foundation um, has a navigating the new Arctic um, uh, theme and one of their big 10 ideas of their funding and they've done a couple of calls for proposals um, for research in the Arctic, which require having either a local community partner or an indigenous partner on that. And they have gotten roundly criticized for not doing a robust engagement with and, and really bringing those indigenous partners and local um, people into the early parts of formulating the research projects. Many of the teams at the last minute called up someone and said, will you be a co-I on this proposal with me, but didn't really involve them in the um, formulation. Um, and now NSF has just last week um, awarded a grant to uh, create a new Navigating the New Arctic Community Office, where there will be people focused on figuring out how to help scientists make the right kind of connections and bring them in earlier in the process. So I think that increasingly we're going to see those kinds of demands on our science that it's not going to be enough to just say, well, I'm studying something relevant to climate. And I'm seeing that in, in really every, every project that we're doing that we're providing advice to the government on, on um, climate priorities. In USGCRP, we did a report about enhancing participation in the program where we urged USGCRP to proactively develop partnerships with non-federal partners, um, as well as to more actively bring in other parts of the federal government that's closer to decision making. So for example, in NOAA, the Marine Fishery Service was not actively involved in global change research. You could argue that there would be something beneficial there. Um, and so I, I just feel like that is that that's shifting and, and really some of that kind of what I remember from being in grad school of like the um, the stigma of doing more applied research. I think that's almost shifting now to a stigma of like if you're not actually thinking about how your research is helping the world in the space that you're you're you know I feel like that that is moving that way. Great. Um, we're getting more questions, so I won't uh, turn to others right now. But the um, I will say that that basic versus applied is probably still most fraught in the technology area where David Hart. Um, is the expert on the panel where this is still the issue of how to get um, what, how far down the, the pipeline that no one thinks actually exists, the government policy should, should go. Um, let me get to the next question, which actually turns out to build off something Amanda just said, and maybe I'll turn uh, to Tim first on it. Um, it says, uh, can you speak to the value of acting locally with stakeholders? Is there a pivot to more 
uh, engage citizens in climate research and solutions? Does it make sense to start in communities with local actors that know the community best? That obviously applies to, um, I'll broaden it so that it's about policy and not just climate, but Tim, do you wanna take a stab at that? No, absolutely. And I mean, the short answer is yes, there's a great deal of value in engaging. Um, I, you know, I think of when sort of looking at some of the questions, the, the, the political nature of this science, when you get to more, the more local stakeholders and, the, and, and those who are managing our resources close to the ground, there's a, there isn't nearly the scientific uh, battle over it. It's, it's, become, it's much more practical conversation. I think thinking of you know, the, the salt of the earth, um, uh, you know, town managers along the coast of North Carolina, we work with on coastal resilience. And, um, you know, they, they are deeply familiar with the challenges, but also societal challenges, and I think, uh, and, and, and the cultural challenges in their communities. And I think it's a, it's a, it allows the science to target some really good pragmatic questions that are necessary to solve, for example, the challenge of coastal resilience on North Carolina. I also think um, uh, when you you know get into those conversations and 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 have that sort of engagement is a good way to make science tangible and real and less of a less of a political football of an argument and more more of a um, more of a uh, solutions oriented endeavor that, that that people from both parties can can come around. You can depoliticize the issue a little bit, with, particularly with the engagement at the, at the more local and management levels. Great, I think that's right. I mean, the way the politics play out locally tends to be different. Um, uh, the next question actually is directed at David, uh, to not at David Hart. Um, it says, uh, American manufacturers consume much of the energy consumption in the US. Um, and then David, it asks, given your experience, do you have any recommendations to help manufacturers reduce their carbon footprint? So I actually want to circle back to the previous question just briefly, yeah, please. And more of a plea for uh, central action. So I think this is another one of those tensions that has to be balanced. And uh, I think the US system often has actually too much sometimes delegation to the state and local levels. I mean, the obvious area at the moment for this is transmission planning and electricity. And it's really hard to get a um, power line built. There's a great book by Russell Gild Gold called uh, superpower if you're interested in this guy tried to build uh, basically a wire across um, uh, Arkansas and um, there wasn't much benefit to Arkansas so that was bad on him but um, it would be good if there was some central authority there. Uh, on the question of manufacturing this is um, something we're increasingly focusing on. Um, the federal effort in, in manufacturing has mostly been targeted to energy efficiency rather than decarbonization. It's actually not a mandate of the Department of Energy at all at the highest level, though obviously it's acting on uh, climate. Um, so I think it would be good if the department was given that mandate and that industrial emissions and industrial issues were raised up within its structure. Um, there's gonna be a need for some pretty radical process changes if we're gonna get to zero in 30 years, or even if we're only gonna get, let, let's say we, get to 50% reductions for industry, which may be more realistic, we're still gonna need some pretty radical process changes. And I think that could create an opening for, um, for the US to reclaim some manufacturing uh, areas that it's lost. But um, I think it's gonna require a serious public investment up front in collaboration with, with the industry. Um, uh, others have spoken to this as well. The government needs to have partners um, and in that in that area there's no alternative but to work with um, work with industry and I think work with labor as well um, and and with regions I mean there's an opportunity as well to engage states here um, to combine both bottom bottom up and top down strategies for, for manufacturing so I think it's an opportunity but from a climate point of view it is really really looking hard great thanks um, the next question uh, appears to be directed to me. So um, it says, given my experiences, what advice do you have for getting universities to prioritize advocacy related to climate change? If everything is a priority, nothing is. Um, my university, the questioner says, cares about climate, but it's proportional to the climate science faculty we have on campus. Um, 
grad students uh, on that campus want stronger advocacy. So, you know, this is, um, uh, so it's a good question. It's a little tricky in the sense of, I think the universities as institutions um, probably can't advocate or shouldn't advocate for as for on the details of policies um, because it's not sort of an institutional issue. I think universities can do more in terms of being voices for action on climate more generally. Um, I know we got uh, the MIT Energy Initiative, for example, to um, file comments uh, against one of the uh, Trump measures to weaken existing uh, climate regulations. Um, but the fact that the university's institutions um, maybe can't play sort of the advocacy group, the advocacy group role doesn't mean that there aren't lots of things they can do, including, you know, facilitating both faculty and students um, to participate more in the climate discussion. That can be, um, first of all, arranging things to actually inform the climate discussion, um, given the, the experts. It can involve helping grad students uh, connect with uh, the policy arena, both by providing information and um, acting as a go-between. Most major universities have um, offices that, like the one that I run, uh, either based in DC or on campus that are doing government affairs. Um, so I think there's a lot more that universities can do to lift their voices on this without universities saying, I support this bill, for example. Um, and it was interesting that we had uh, a webinar with uh, then Secretary Kerry, uh, because he didn't have his new title yet back in the summer. Um, and he was actually asked, um, you know, do you think universities should be doing more? And he actually sort of um, had the same caveat, said, um, now it was a webinar with the university president and he didn't want to put President Reif in a tough spot, but it clearly was something he had thought about. And so I think Basically, there's a lot more universities can and should be doing without crossing into the the university supports, you know, bill number X on a particular issue on on climate. There's also obviously David, universities can do. Um, sorry, Tim, one sec. On um, uh, in terms of obviously their own carbon footprint and being good examples and so forth. Tim, sure, go ahead. No, I just want to speak this because, uh, you know, this is the Nickel Sensor was created to serve <laughs> in this mission. Right. And I, I just want to be, able, I want to push a little harder on what universities can do. Um, yeah, universities should not become, I'll say, first start with what we should not, we should not become the umpteenth advocacy group that advocate for climate. There's, there are plenty, but, but there also are, you know, our politics is in a place where actual factual inquiry is a very difficult endeavor. That, that, that the two parties and universities remain some of the more trusted voices to work through the detailed, not only on the, the natural science, but all the facts. So ha having the universities can lean much harder into being resources to the policy process to help policymakers understand the challenges, weigh the balances, and then let the, the policymakers make the valid judgments. Um, and I would encourage, you know, my institution is, 50 people strong, professional staff, completely dedicated to that bridging mission. Not, not the faculty, not primarily teaching, but dedicated to putting the university at service of society in that way. And I think that universities could have a much stronger role if they're helping our policymakers navigate, um, really navigate the, 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 the trade-offs and the challenges. Last day, I'll say to David's point, there's no way we can do this all at the local scale. The, thing, the change we need is at major scale, industrial leaders, federal government global solutions. I, I didn't mean to just otherwise. I just think that the state and the local gives you a political lens that you can then bring back up to the to the scale of change we need. Great. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100% with the comment on universities doing more. We're trying to do more of that at MIT. Um, and uh, I think other universities, I mean, it's an area where, frankly, universities should be competing with each other in terms of who's providing the most input on climate. Um, I'm not going to turn to Amanda right now. Oh, okay, I will if you want. Uh, I was going to say. The National, Academy, 
National Academies is in the same position. I want to get to one more question, but Amanda, go ahead. Well, I was going to say the national, the, the university should be working with the academies to help, you know, do that uh, translation. In fact, I've been having this conversation with the leadership of the National Academies right now with Marsha McNutt and others. Um, and they, because we're thinking about setting up our own center on climate change. Um, and they have asked me the question repeatedly, well, how is this going to dip be different from what universities are offering and the kind of centers that are already out there. Um, and another example is the, the one that Caltech is leading on with a major do donation, um, I think is a sort of consortium of different universities also trying to kind of take that research and bring it closer to the policy space. Um, so I think there's, I think there's, um, there's a lot, I'm seeing a lot of that kind of movement that way. Um, and I, my feeling is that groups like the National Academies who also kind of see themselves in that objective independent space need to step up and be a better sort of point of intersection and interface there as well. No, that, that's absolutely right. Um, and um, it was not because of my institutional hat that I forgot to mention that Caltech example. Um, the, uh, so, uh, we'll see if we have a time for a question beyond this one, but I think it's it's one that um, probably a lot of people have in their minds from time to time. So the question is, if we are unable to convince people to, and this will go across the panel, if we are unable to convince people to wear a mask, which has direct and observable life-saving effects on their life, how are we to convince them of climate solutions, which may be more abstract and less direct to their lives? I, I would say two things to get us started. One is that, um, Clearly, the mask uh, debate didn't have to work out <laughs> the way that it has. Secondly, it's not actually immediately observable, right? It's not if you're not wearing a mask at that moment, you drop dead and your friend doesn't. Um, and the third is I think the, um, the kinds of things that are involved with climate solutions, which are institutional in many ways, and one reason why David and Tim both uh, did talk about the need for federal as well as state and local and, and international as well. Um, it raises actually a different uh, set of concerns. And the last thing I'll say is um, the polling actually showed and actually it almost influenced the Trump administration before, the, um, before Trump um, went the other way that even most Republicans at that point supported mask wearing. And so, um, the mask wearing is not a happy story, but I don't think it um, foretells doom for climate solutions. But why don't we go um, across the panel? Let's do it in, um, well, actually, let's do it in the order, pe order people spoke to begin with since Gabrielle hasn't spoken most recently. So go ahead. Uh, sure. So I, I'm going to say some of the solutions people are adopting, not even knowing their climate solutions, renewable energy, wind, solar is cheaper. There are plenty of places adopting that technology just as it's the better one. Think about LED light bulbs. I can change the color of my bathroom and I love it. And you don't have to sell me on the climate piece. Pass them the mic. Great. Um, Tim. Uh, two thoughts that came to mind. One is let's not let's not make this a static situation. I think the fact that we had trouble getting people to masks was a teachable moment for the country. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, yes, we've had the erosion in confidence in science and expertise. Maybe we're at a moment we can, we can seize the, the you know, the rec uh, reflection on COVID and realize that uh, we might want to listen to scientists a little more. Second, um, we don't have to teach everybody to wear a mask or to change their light bulb, although we want to have them change the light bulb. Go back to today's point. Some of these decisions and the most influential ones are made at scale at very sophisticated levels. And those will permeate down through the economy. And so we, that we, you want to think about the points of decision making. You may not have to get John Q. Public on every decision. Great, David. So I, I think what's important is to think about um, opportunity and um, and uh, uh, hope. I think people shut down when they're asked. Uh, to sacrifice and, and the, the messaging focuses on the threat. Now, I don't, you know, it's different with climate change and, and um, COVID, but I think the, you know, we're gonna make progress if people see a vision of themselves in this future, as many people as possible see a vision of themselves in this future. It's great if, as Gabrielle said, you know, if it's cheaper and better, 
that's fantastic. Uh, if it realizes some value that's a little bit different, even if it costs a little more. But I think that the cardinal sin that uh, many people have committed is just focusing on trying to scare people to death. And uh, I think we've proven over the last uh, 30 years, you know, that doesn't work. So I'm excited that the, this administration is trying to offer a different message and uh, I hope we can build on that. Great, Amanda. I totally agree with all my panelists, fellow panelists on their remarks. Um, and just add to that too, that there is, um, you know, there are, there's a whole science around um, social and behavioral sciences. There are experts in these matters and there have been pushes for, you know, decades to get them more actively engaged in, in the climate research. And, um, and I think they have a lot to offer here too. And I would, even on the COVID piece, the National Academies established a standing committee specifically to provide rapid advice from the social sciences um, in, uh, on those topics. And so this, this is something I think that could also offer um, um, a lot of help. And I will say, perhaps the best climate talk I ever saw was given by a Disney Imagineer who, um, <laughs> I, I kid you not, who kind of asked the um, audience to imagine a future in which all of these technological innovations had made your life better. And it wasn't about sacrifice and it really was about hope. So I, I agree completely that, that you know, there's an opportunity to pivot there and really help people imagine this um, as, you know, a positive thing for the future. Great. Um, the, I won't prevent myself from making some remark about Mickey Mouse solutions, but the, um, uh, so the last question, and we only have a couple of minutes for it, literally, which is probably good because it's so big, you'd really be on the hook if you had more time. And maybe I'll ask it uh, to Tim and uh, if others want to jump in for a second, they can. And it says, what role can government agencies play to actively include uh, environmental justice um, in their climate planning? And what can government employees do to make climate justice part of their work, even if it's not an, an agency mandate? Although I think now it will be, so. Yeah, the, the second question is clearly a mandate from the top in this administration, unless they're limited by the authorities of, that they're executing, they're going to, um, I, you know, the, the, what can they do to make it an integral to their regulations? It, it, you know, the Administrative Procedures Act requires the government to, to evaluate and listen to the impacts that what they're doing is on all, all, all communities, and they can make a very strong, and I think they will, affirmative, affirmative uh, 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 outreach to those communities to make sure they, under, they understand and account for the impacts. Two more quick thoughts. One is, uh, that you know a lot of you know a lot of these agencies don't have a single tool in the toolkit. You know the, the greenhouse gas rules may not be able to control for everything for for a small community if you're trying to regulate a plant. But you also have all the toxic air pollution or in the traditional air pollution tools, and you can use them in conjunction with each other to make sure you're protecting people. Lastly, I think as I said in my talk, we need to actually figure out what some of these metrics mean. What does it mean to work on behalf of some of these communities and, and make sure that and we're living up to the equity, uh, equitable uh, concerns that underlie the transition. Great, thanks. That was a great compact and concise answer. The um, I'm glad you you mentioned the Administrative Procedure Act. I mean, an implicit line through all this is you know the intersection of law and science and um, the administration Administrative Procedure Act, which goes back to the 1940s, is really the Funda gives the fundamental structure for all the uh, regulatory writing. So that can be uh, a homework assignment for people to uh, look into that. It's also the basis on which the Trump administration lost most of its uh, environmental cases um, and wasn't able to roll back uh, rules the way they had hoped. Um, with that, thanks for a great panel. We really covered a lot. I think hopefully our audience found it helpful. Uh, Shailen, back to you to close up. Thanks so much, David, and thanks so much to our panelists. We have just one minute remaining. So folks, I'm just gonna give you some, some helpful information here, just one minute more. Uh, we will have two more uh, sessions in the series. Join us next Friday with our colleagues from AAAS, Joanne Carney will be moderating a panel on what does scientific merit and excellence mean? What should it mean? We want to hear from you and to get some ideas, we'll, we'll hear from some of Joanne and, and her colleagues. 
Then we'll follow that up with the session on public engagement in science and this local perspective with Erica Kimmerling from Aztec and some of her colleagues who've really been addressing this local state and citizen science question that we sometimes always get to hear in Washington. Um, uh, so stay tuned for those. And just a reminder that all of these recordings are made available on our YouTube channel and posted on our Call for Papers website. Um, we also have a workshop recording uh, available online, which included uh, remarks from Toby Smith and Debbie Stein from our board. So take, take a look at that if you haven't already. And with that, I just want to thank David Goldston, David Hart, Gabrielle Dreyfus, Tim Profeta, and Amanda Stout for just joining us and having a great discussion. Thanks so much to all of you so much. Thank you. Snaps all around. And with that, have a great long weekend for those of you in the U.S. and happy Valentine's Day. Cheers.